tropical beaches and swaying palms and beautiful orange, red, pink, blue, green sunsets that we've got none of it because we're all stuck at home during quarantine. So this is my episode on five tropical tiki drinks to help you escape. Woo! Tiki. Tiki is a weird thing, okay? Tiki is a weird thing because it's always pretend. It is a pretend thing. That's not to say that it doesn't borrow from very real people and places and cultures and that those people and places and cultures don't exist because they do. It's just that tiki as American bartending is concerned isn't about that really. Um, I wish it was more so, but tiki as an American concept isn't about actually honoring any of those cultures or places or people in any real or meaningful way. It's a largely post-war, there's some debate about that, I guess. I had always thought that it was a post-war thing, it happened after World War II, but it really kind of got going in the 30s. And it is, it is exactly that. It is a, a ersatz bit of cultural appropriation. And it really, I think, comes out of California and it wasn't a thing that you did on vacation. You didn't, you know, it was a thing that you did on the weekend when you had to go back to work on Monday in California or in, or in Michigan. And there was snow on the ground maybe. And you wanted to pretend that you were on vacation for a few hours. So it's this mid-century made up pretend time, role-playing, LARP experience, <laughs> cosplay even about these vacation destinations that only maybe even exist in your mind. So I guess the one question that comes up sometimes is, is Tiki problematic? And I think the answer is that it can be, but I think that as long as you don't trick yourself into thinking that your Mai Tai is a stand-in or actual representation of a real culture, you recognize that it is a American construct that comes from the mid-century. Maybe it, it drives an interest in discovering those histories and those uh, faiths and religions and those people. Then maybe it's not problematic. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. I do know this. I, I, you can't ever tell somebody that they're not allowed to be offended by something. If they are, they are. Um, so I don't know actually if people take offense to uh, appropriation as it pertains to tiki drinks and culture. If they do, I apologize. I do know that I enjoy a tiki drink. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. And since it seems like the vast majority of us are stuck at home, it seems to me like a great opportunity to mix up some pretend vacation drinks so that we can all escape a little bit, um, if only in our minds from our quarantine situation. My first drink on this tiki list is my favorite drink, I think, of all time, the Mai Tai, invented by Trader Vic, actually, although Don the Beachcomber claims that Vic stole it and based it off of his QB Punch. But the QB Punch has so many ingredients and it bears almost no resemblance to a Mai Tai. It's a, a bit of a stretch in my imagination. Uh, no, in fact, I, I think that Trader Vic is probably telling the truth on this. The Mai Tai got a really bad rap, and that's because Vic didn't really popularize his recipe, and uh, certainly Orjo was not in a lot of bars. And people had had, at one of the Trader Vic's establishments, a Mai Tai, then went to another bar and tried to describe it. This is the story I read. And they said, oh, fruit juices and rum. Okay. So a good Mai Tai has got no pineapple juice, no orange juice, none, none of that. Uh, it's just lime juice, rum, Orjo and Curacao. So the way I make a Mai Tai is one ounce of lime juice, half an ounce of Orjo. Uh, a lot of people say only a quarter ounce. I think that you've got Orjo in it, you should let it be forward. I do go with a half an ounce. You, know, you want to accentuate that almond flavor. Half an ounce of Curacao, half an ounce of simple syrup. I like a two to one ratio Demerara simple here. Uh, Trader Vic would have referred to this as a rich simple or actually um, as rock candy syrup and two ounces of rum. Now in Vic's day, it was uh, originally this 17 year old Ray and nephew rum. You cannot get that anymore. You can't get that since like the 
40s or 50s. He then went to a blend of rums, um, and I think that you can do the same thing here. Remember that the Ray and Nephew is a funky Jamaican rum. I personally like to stick to that. I like an ounce of Smith and & Cross and an ounce of El Dorado 8 year. I think that's a great Mai Tai. You can use two rums of your choice, or three rums, or four rums of your choice, uh, up to about two ounces. Please stay away from any of your uh, spice drums. We don't need to add a bunch of like weird artificial vanilla flavors here. Shake it up, serve it over the ice that it was shaken over, over some cracked ice. The traditional garnish is a sprig of mint, which I think is vital, and a half of a lime, so that, that looks like a, a little green island with a palm tree. I think the lime is less important. Uh, don't shake it with the lime. I like the sprig of mint. The mint is important, I think. I think that combo really works well together. There are variations on a Mai Tai. I like a standard Mai Tai. A lot of people like a bitter Mai Tai. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of a bitter Mai Tai because there's a drink called the Jungle Bird. So if you're not familiar with tiki, if you don't like tiki, a Jungle Bird is probably something you don't expect because you probably think the tiki is all overly sweet, sugary, syrupy, cloyingly sweet rum-based drinks. And the Jungle Bird is not that. The Jungle Bird is a refreshing, and bitter drink. Always tastes like grapefruit to me when it's made right, even though there's no grapefruit juice in it. The Jungle Bird was probably invented at the K.L. Hilton Aviary Bar in 1978. Unlike the Mai Tai, which was destroyed over the years, the Jungle Bird has been improved upon by numerous bartenders over the years. I happen to like the uh, Martin Kate version, actually, that shows up in his book, uh, ooh, which is not on my bar right now, but in his book, Smuggler's Cove book, which is, of course, Martin Kate's bar. So uh, two ounces of pineapple juice, a half an ounce of lime juice, a quarter ounce of Demerara simple syrup, three quarters of an ounce of Campari, very important, and one and a half ounces of like a black strap rum. Shake it up, serve it over the ice you shook it with, and uh, garnish it usually with pineapple fronds and cherries. Sometimes you see people make like a beak out of it, so it looks like there's a bird or a toucan sitting on the thing. It's pretty cool. And a lot of drinks on tiki bar menus are actually from some other place. It's a weird thing that happens where this drink that's not tiki in technical kind of becomes de facto tiki because that's where you're gonna get it. You have this association with it being tiki. It's kind of similar in my mind to how, yeah, not every detective movie is a film noir. Film noir is a really specific thing that happened in film. Tiki is a little bit like that, where there's a lot of stuff that fits the mold, but wasn't made in the right time or place. So maybe it's not tiki. The Singapore Sling is one of these, because the Singapore Sling goes back to way before tiki, I think in the 20s, if I'm not mistaken. This hotel in Singapore, Raffles, uh, lays claim to it. They say it was invented at the Long Bar at Raffles. Now, David Wondrich, I read an article, he claims, you know, there's a lot of these pink slings that you find all over in Singapore. Prior to that, you see them in newspaper articles and in accounts, so yeah, I don't know if Raffles invented this. Um, and further, just somewhat recently, Raffles had to kind of rediscover the recipe because they had messed it all up for years with a lot of um, like sour mix. And then they wanted to get the original recipe back, but they had never written it down. So they had to find barbacks who were still alive, who had worked at the bar in the 20s um, to ask them to kind of recount it by memory. And from what I have read, although I've never been to Raffles, their version is actually not so great and maybe to be avoided, <laughs> other than as a tourist curiosity. Uh, the recipe that I made on my show a while back I, I, is still pretty good, but I've changed my spec a bit. I now go with two ounces of a London Dry Gin, half an ounce of lemon juice, half an ounce of pineapple juice, so split that, right? A quarter ounce of Benedictine, very important, and a half an ounce of cherry hearing or some other cherry brandy. Not Kirschwasser, but like a cherry flavored brandy. Shake all that up, pour it over a big cube or something in a highball and hit it with some seltzer. It should foam up. That's what the pineapple helps with. Give very nice reddish pink color. I love these drinks. They have a very delicate balance. They just that that little bit of um, of Benedictine brings an herbal quality to them that is just it's just on point. It's just a wonderful drink. It's a very, very, very um, enjoyable drink to sip. Uh, certainly has an exotic 
faraway flavor to it as well. Uh, and great on a hot day. It is getting hot out. Now the next one's another one. This is a real tiki drink, but invented in Hawaii. So it's part of the mid-century tiki movement. Uh, it was invented at the Hale Kulani Hotel in Waikiki and served at a bar that has, I think, my favorite name for any bar everywhere, anywhere, uh, a bar called The Room Without a Key. A uh, brilliant name for a bar. Now, again, this is another one of those tiki drinks that will maybe defy your expectations because unlike most other tiki drinks, uh, this one is based on bourbon. I discovered this drink when I made it for the show a while back. I fell in love with this drink. This is a very good drink. A lot of fruit juices here though. I had an instinct to use a very proofy bourbon here uh, just to balance it against all of the fruit juices that were in the drink. I went with Booker's bourbon, which is, if I'm not mistaken, 126 proof. I think any bourbon is gonna work. I would look for something that's got a little punch to it though, just to stand up to all the other flavors that you're throwing around. Now, I, I went with half an ounce of lime juice, half an ounce of orange juice, half an ounce of pineapple juice, just a quarter ounce of Demerara simple syrup, just a half a teaspoon of grenadine, a drop, a little bit of grenadine, a tiny amount, homemade grenadine, and uh, one and a half ounces of Booker's bourbon. This drink usually calls for a couple dashes of Angostura bitters, but I held that off on that, served it into a coupe, and then using a misto, sprayed a flamethrower of Angostura bitters over the top of it. Oh man, what that does to a drink. I think that actually Jeff Morgenthaler kind of invented that technique for a particular sour he was making. I stole it. First off, you fill the room with the smell of burning Ango, which is wonderful. You coat the surface of the drink with Angostura, but it's like a little bit caramelized and a little bit smokier. Um, and of course the presentation is super fun. If you do that, please be careful. I really liked this drink. I think that if you think that you're not a tiki person because you like bourbon and whiskey and rah, rye, I think you might like this drink, um, particularly with the bookers. Next up is the painkiller. This drink was invented in the 70s at Joost van Dyck, a very famous bar called the Soggy Dollar Bar. It's in the uh, Virgin Islands. The Soggy Dollar Bar is kind of famous amongst cruising sailors, folks who have basically floating motorhomes that they like to scoot around the ocean and island hop in. Oh, how I long to join the ranks and bring my show to you from the waves. So named because to get to the bar, you had to drop anchor and swim up. And so all the money you spent would be soggy, the soggy dollar bar. Sometimes people call this a better or more mature pina colada. I feel like that is, it does disservice to both drinks. The pina colada has a real history to it. And this drink is very, very good in its own right. To, to make it a other a version of something else is not fair to it. It's one of only two truly legally patented drinks I know of. Uh, the other one being a dark and stormy. This one, uh, the patent says you've got to make it with Pusser's Rum. I've never made it with Pusser's Rum and no one has ever complained about my painkiller. They say that they're quite good. So if you feel the need to make it with Pusser's Rum, feel free. Otherwise, I would go with the rum of your choice. And I would stay away always from spiced rums because you're bringing in flavors you don't plan on. But, you know, a Bacardi Gold is going to be fine here. If you have better rum that you want to use, like fancy rum, more, you know, maybe a Jamaican rum would be a mistake. I would like that. I would like a funky Smith & Cross or something or, or, or uh, Appleton Estate here. But I feel like most people are going to want something a little bit more mild. It calls for cream of coconut, which is not the same thing as coconut cream. Coconut cream, if I'm not mistaken, is a thing that happens to coconut milk inside of a coconut at a particular phase of a coconut's level of ripeness. You know, coconut starts out filled with water, milk, coconut water. And as the coconut gets riper and more complete, that turns gelatinous and eventually solid all the way through. One of those phases is coconut cream. Cream of coconut, which is what we're talking about, is made by combining coconut milk with sugar and maybe a, a pinch of salt. And you can make it yourself. I do feel like uh, growing up and certainly most of my life, the natural and appropriate way to get it was to buy a can of Coco Lopez from the supermarket, but you can make your own uh, and it's gonna be better. 
and everybody will think it's really neat. And it's very easy to make. It's basically equal parts sugar and a can of coconut milk and a pinch of salt. Cook them up together until they're dissolved and boom, done. It needs a little bit of nutmeg for a garnish. That's sort of considered vital for a painkiller, but hey, if you don't have it, I think you'll enjoy the drink anyway. <laughs> Let me think here, what did we do? We did a Mai Tai, real classic tiki. Uh, the Mai Tai, very um, spirit forward, real accentuates that rum, right? We did a Jungle Bird. Jungle Bird is a bitter drink that a lot of people, over, I mean, it just defies your expectations of what tiki is about. We talked about a Singapore sling, got some gin in there, and also that brings into the mix this sort of proto tiki, actual um, imported drinks from far-flung locations. I mean, colonialism as well, I guess, really, though, unfortunately. Uh, we got the Halakulani cocktail in there, which is a bourbon-based tiki drink, which is uh, definitely outside of what you probably think of when you think of tiki, unless you already know that the Halakulani cocktail exists. And the painkiller! It's a quintessential beach drink, is what it really is. I mean, <laughs> it's super easy to make. It goes great in a solo cup. <laughs> Not exaggerated. Uh, you can make them strong or weak. They're, they're, they're always delicious. Um, and it's uh, just absolutely divine if you happen to have your toes in the sand. All of which I hope will help you escape your confines as we ride out our social distancing and quarantine. Little vacations in a glass. That was the idea. Some little bits of escape which you can hopefully mix up after a trip to a grocery store. Because we do have to do, we still have to keep grocery shopping, right? So hopefully um, you will be able to either you have the ingredients on hand for some of this or you'll be able to get them in, in short order. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, throw a tweet my way if you make one of these or, or uh, you know, tag me in an Instagram, let me know. I'd love to hear how you are uh, weathering the storm. And I will make this episode sort of the head of a new little playlist of these five tiki drinks. But I do have a whole tiki playlist, so I don't know, maybe I'll figure out how to plug that into this, um, of a lot of tiki drinks. Uh, and it's tiki time, man. Summer's coming. Use your backyard or your deck or your window, whatever you got. Turn on a sun lamp. Pretend you're in the, you just look at pictures of the beach while you have a drink in your hand. That'll be good. Try that out. That's what I'm gonna do. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope everybody is healthy and safe and sound. Um, and uh, this has been How to Drink, a show about making cocktails and how to drink them. I am Greg. You can find me on Twitter at How to Drink. You can find me on Instagram at How to Drink. And you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. And I hope you will. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm doing that's live these days, and it's on Twitch for the most part. Until next time, this is How to Drink saying good night and good luck. Stealing lines from uh, people who are not me. I don't have a drink in my hand. I messed up this episode. I should have had a drink in my hand. Yeah, next time. <laughs> if you like pina coladas I'm getting cold in the rain If you're not into yoga And are into champagne if you like it, can love at midnight on the dunes of the Cape. I got two tickets down the paradise, and we'll make our escape. Just had to get that in there, I'm sorry. I also got all the lyrics wrong. Isn't that fun? It sure is. <laughs>